Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Catholic Saints. My name is Taylor Kemp. I'm the director of Formed, and with me today is Dr. John Seahorn, the academic dean at the Graduate School of Theology and a teacher of Catholic Theology. Is there anything else you would like to say in an introductory sense before we get into our saints? Just today? that I'm always happy to be with you, Taylor. I'm happy to be with you, too. And I think, folks out there, that John might mean that sincerely. I'd say 80% sincere. 85 85. The other 15% of him would like to be reading books, but we are going to talk about something that you do read about in books, which is St. Cyprian. That's right. Tell us about St. Cyprian. What do you know about St. Cyprian, Taylor? You he's did a, have my course. I did. I did. Okay. So uh, he's a saint for one. I He was early. That's a good start. Thank yeah. you. feel good about that one. Yeah. Um, he was an early saint. Uh, I, I don't know his exact date, so I'm going to guess, and you can correct me. I think that he was around the fourth century. <clears throat> Fifth. Third. Third. Yeah, he is He is pretty early. So we don't know a lot about his early life. Um, he was born probably right maybe after the turn of the third century, so around okay. 202 or so. Uh, was from North Africa, okay, which of course is, uh, is part of the Roman Empire at this time. Uh, he's from the main city of North Africa, Carthage, right, which had been a, 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 a kind of um, classical enemy of Rome mm -hmm. uh, in the centuries before Christ, but now was uh, an important city in the empire. He had um, kind of a, a, a classical pagan upbringing. He was not raised uh, in a Christian family, um, but eventually had a conversion, um, probably in his 40s. So around... Late conversion. Yeah, late conversion. Uh, around 246, we think, he was baptized. I keep saying around because we really just don't know a lot about his life uh, before he became... Uh, a bishop. So presumably we don't know why he converted, what brought it about? No, nope, not a lot. Okay. Not a lot. Um, so he, he becomes Catholic in about 246 and very quickly is elevated to the episcopacy. So he becomes bishop uh, around 248. Okay. Yeah, which is unusual, mm -hmm. um, but less unusual then than it might be now. Yes, which would might be interesting for people to hear that, but... Yeah, we have, we have a life happen. of Cyprian that doesn't give us many details, but... Um, uh, by a deacon named um, Pontian or Pontius, I actually can't remember. Okay. Um, even I forget things, Taylor. That's good. See, it makes it makes us all feel better. Well, I guess so. So we'll call him Ponty, uh, Ponty the deacon. Um, he actually sort of apologizes for the fact that Cyprian was made a bishop so quickly because Paul in First Timothy says uh -huh. that bishops shouldn't be recent yeah, converts. Right. He's like, well, he's the exception that proves the rule because he was pretty great. Even Ambrose. Him and yeah, Ambrose was even more extreme. Yeah, yeah <laughs> catechumen to bishop. Yeah. Okay, so he uh, becomes Catholic. He is quickly uh, ordained to be a bishop. Mm -hmm. What happens next? Oh my gosh, all heck breaks loose. Okay, so um, we think he became a bishop in about two forty eight. Um, uh, the following year, there was a new Roman emperor, uh, a guy named Decius. Okay, uh, okay, and Decius. Um, was sort of uh, kind of an old school military man, and um, the the empire that he uh, that he stepped into um, as ruler was was kind of in a bit of disarray. There were um, it's known as the crisis of the third century, and uh, it gets pretty complicated. But it's it's um it's a time of real turmoil, and Decius is like, you know what we need? We need some good old time religion, hmm. right? And of course, in his case, surprising from the emperor. I guess it would depend on what he means by old time religion. Well, he but... means Roman religion. Oh, there you he go. He means pagan religion. It's not good. I take it back. Yeah. And so this, this um, becomes in effect the first empire wide persecution of Christians, right? Um, why? Because Decius uh, orders mm -hmm. that um, all citizens have to offer sacrifice to the Roman gods, right? And they have to obtain what's called, it was called a libellus, like a little certificate. Uh, saying that um, that they had done so. Related to that, so it's interesting, uh, and I do. Some of these things are coming back from your class. Oh, that's good. Uh, it is good, but that it, this. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, it's not like the emperor is coming forth and saying necessarily like we need uh, to deepen our faith in the gods per se. He's he's trying to figure out how do I unite people. How do I pull this? He, yeah, this I think that's fair. But I, I also together? think. I mean. Decius, as kind of a good conservative Roman, um, thought of the relationship with the gods as kind of one of um, appeasement mm -hmm. uh, that would earn their protection, 
right? So things are going badly. Well, we need okay. to appease the gods. We need to all be on the same page in honoring the gods mm -hmm. so that the gods will honor us, so to speak, by uh, by supplying peace and tranquility. So he does kind of have a vertical and horizontal view of it. Vertical in the sense of we need to appease the gods. That'll yeah. bring us back to some stable ground. Uh, but then also knowing like you can really unite a people through belief. For sure. And and, and I, I do think it's fair to say that um, in the empire, both of those dimensions were somewhat understood. There. So we often yeah, okay. talk about the Pax Romana, mm -hmm. right? The, the Roman peace. Uh, but they would also talk about the Pax Deorum, the peace of the gods, mm. right? The idea that this peace, this concord, prosperity in the empire was a gift from the gods. Interesting. Okay. So uh, Cyprian is, is made a bishop. This is a time of chaos. Decius uh, becomes the emperor. He wants to implement some... Uh, 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 yeah, there's an, edict, an yeah. edict that goes out end of 249, beginning of 250, somewhere in there. Okay, everyone has to, everybody to offer sacrifice. Offer sacrifice. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for Cyprian or the oh people of God? Oh, what a headache. Yeah. Right? Um, so it's, it's actually kind of interesting... Um, even though we, we think of the ancient church as a kind of time of constant persecutions, and mm -hmm. there had been persecutions in the preceding um, in the preceding decades, but there had been several decades at this point of relative peace. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing, Taylor, as uh, I think many of us can relate to, how quickly we become complacent. Yeah. Right. And um, and so Cyprian actually has to deal with um, a flock who not all of whom were really ready for a persecution. Mm -hmm. Right. Because what did this mean? Well, it, it might actually mean red martyrdom, mm -hmm. right? Um, it might mean fleeing, and mm -hmm. they weren't going to like chase you down necessarily, but they were going to confiscate your property. Mm. Okay, so Cyprian himself was not martyred at this time uh, because he he decided it was important for him to be available for his flock when when things sort of subsided, um, and he was criticized for this, uh, and so he defended he defended that decision. Um, and as we'll get to later, he was eventually martyred. So he kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> he kind of proved himself um, that uh, it wasn't out of cowardice that he fled. But that meant giving up all of his possessions. Mm -hmm. They were all seized uh, by the government, which is a true test. Like for sure, all of us um, are working. Would like to think are working toward being detached from this world. But it's like when it when it really hits you, you're yeah. like, oh, whoa, what am I willing to give up from a material sense, from a a location of my home, of relationships, of whatever that it, the idea of the thing and the reality of the thing are often completely different. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting that um, Cyprian even blames uh, clergy for this, too. He says even bishops, he says, we're acting like um, he says it's basically managers of worldly affairs. Interesting. They, they were more busy with sort of secular concerns than they were with uh, with feeding, with feeding the flock of Christ, and with preparing themselves uh, to be leaders. Now there was a lot of heroism. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, so Cyprian fled and then came back. His contemporary, uh, who was the bishop of Alexandria, the other major city in Africa, right mm -hmm. uh, in Egypt, uh, he also fled. Dionysus of Alexandria. He's also he also became a saint. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the Roman bishop, the Pope uh, at the time, uh, Fabian, did not flee and he was martyred, mm -hmm. as was his successor. Hmm. Right. So um, th there, there was a lot of heroism, but there was also a lot of mediocrity. And um, and so one of the big challenges of Cyprian's uh, career was what do you do putting the pieces back together? Because right. he comes back to Carthage and you do have martyrs. You have others who were put in prison but weren't actually martyred. Uh, some of them are actually causing problems because of all the prestige that attaches to that. Hmm. Right. Um, on top of that, you have Christians who had apostatized. Uh, who had just given in and offered sacrifice. You had others who um, had like paid someone off to, to forge a libellus for them, to forge right. a certificate so that they wouldn't get, um, they wouldn't get in trouble, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do you kind of deal with all these? Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that I think we can really admire uh, from Cyprian is um, kind of his, his hard-nosed pastoral sensibilities. Um, and, and you actually see him uh, negotiating these things um, with a lot of different viewpoints around the table. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, passions can be heightened in a situation mm -hmm. like this, a crisis like this. And he's trying to find the right path between the rigorists who are like, look, if you apostatized, you're done for. Mm -hmm. And there were, uh, this actually led to a schism. There was a rigorist group called the Novationists 
who actually said that the church cannot reconcile people who've mm -hmm. apostatized, right? Cyprian's like, no, that's not true. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you had people who were laxists, who were sort of like, oh, well, forgive and forget. Yeah. Let's just sort of move okay. on. okay. It was a tough situation. And Cyprian's like, you're not taking seriously enough um, the fact that mm. you betrayed the Lord who shed his blood for in you. In a public sense, yeah. In a, in a public sense, right? And so he talks a lot about the, the job of a, of a real pastor to be like a good doctor and to apply the right medicine even when the patient doesn't really want to take his medicine. Hmm. And it might be painful, mm -hmm. right? But that ultimately it's for their health and salvation. Yeah, it's... Um... You gotta love the saints. One of the great gifts of the saints uh, is that they take the gospel truths and then bring them into whatever the present day circumstances mm -hmm. is, which is, and this is such a complex thing. Um, and I do feel like it's it's far afield for at least a lot of us that are in America mm -hmm. because we're not, we're not facing a kind of r uh, red martyrdom threat. But when you look at like the layers of complexity here, when you're talking about the rigorous and the laxist and the apostatized and the people who paid off, you have people who outright publicly participate in a thing. Then you take a step back and you've got people who allowed it to be presented as if they did, but in fact they didn't, but that's still a public witness. Yeah. And then you have like the prestige of the people who were martyred. It's, it is a, um, it's a great gift to be able to rely on the saints to help us. How do we interpret the, yeah. the things in front of us uh, as, as they relate to the, the truths that are never changing? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, so so that he sort of you know tried to guide the church through that, and it, it really that occupied a lot of the rest of yeah, sure. his life, right? So um, he was in. There were controversies that arose from this, um, and and he even butted heads with the Pope hmm. uh, over over dealing with with some of these issues. And it's interesting that we've canonized Cyprian along with Pope Stephen, mm -hmm. whom he butted heads with. Pope Stephen's position was the right one. Mm -hmm. um, and, but you sort of see this, that, that these are men who, who deeply understand themselves to be responsible to the Lord for the task that they've been given as bishops, mm -hmm. right? And so even when they have um, theological disagreements about, um, about how to kind of deal, and there, there, there is theology that, that underlies these pastoral yep. decisions, right? Um, right? Real pastoral theology is never something separate from, from mm -hmm. doctrine. And, um, and so it's, it is kind of beautiful too, to see both of them canonized. Yeah. And, and right? in a sense, subject to the church. For sure. Writ yep, large, that's exactly right? right? Like yeah. that even in the midst of, we're talking about two saints that neither one in themselves carried, um, the authoritative endpoint of where doctrine lies. They contributed to it, but it was actually within the clash of them that the church works out where things stand. Yeah, no, I think I think that's well said. Um, and we won't get into the, the details, um, not because they're not interesting, they're very yep. interesting, and I love to talk about them, but uh, it would take us too far afield. Um, and I think there are some other things we can learn from Cyprian. I, I do want to just mention, uh, as I said earlier, that um, he, he, um, he was eventually martyred, so there was mm -hmm. another persecution that broke out in 257. Uh, he didn't flee. Uh, this time he was arrested and first exiled. And then he was put to death by the sword in 258. Mm. And um, the deacon that I was calling Ponty, since I still can't remember <laughs> his exact name, uh, it's actually really moving when he talks about that day and how it was a hot day. Uh -huh. um, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And he, he sort of saw a beauty in that, the radiance of the sun showing the true victory that Cyprian would enjoy. That's cool. But then how they had to, they marched in this place and he sat down and he was sweating, mm. um, but that he just sort of took the suffering and he's like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm about to die. It doesn't matter. And then just um, his self-possession mm -hmm. that he blindfolded himself mm. and then had to kind of give encouragement to the executioner who was kind of feeling wow. shaky. Um, and, uh, and then it, it seems to be the case that those who were sort of there to honor, uh, Bishop Cyprian, um, were able to get his garments, which were soaked in his blood wow. and able to venerate those as relics. And he, he, he's the most famous, um, uh, martyr of North Africa. He was actually the first, uh, I believe the first priest or Bishop of Carthage to be martyred. Mm. And, uh, and so it was a huge cult of St. Cyprian uh, into the, the fourth century and later. So um, we have a lot of um, like Augustine talking about Cyprian because mm -hmm. Cyprian was sort of um, mm -hmm. the, the greatest local hero That's in his cool. time. That's great. Well, we uh, are wrapping up here. Dr. Seahorn, would you mind giving um, just maybe a, a couple of final points of reflection or things that we can 
from things we talked about today from St. Cyprian that we could kind of carry into our, well, our world and thought and reflection today? Yeah, maybe, maybe let me let me peel back a little bit kind of the surface of what we were talking about. And um, it seems to me that um, if you really want to see Cyprian's heart, um, it's important to read a lot of his works. But one that one that to me um, has been very valuable is um, a treatise he wrote on the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. where he gives a kind of commentary on the Lord's Prayer. Um, what does it mean for Christians to pray? Why do we pray this way? What, you know, what do we mean by each of these petitions? And maybe just take three quick glances at it, right? Mm -hmm. The first is um, he really emphasizes the fact that we call God our Father and that we can only do so because of our baptism, because of our rebirth into the sonship of Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, who not only gave us the words to pray, but whose voice we pray in right? Only Christ can truly call God our Father. And that becomes the kind of basis for everything else that Cyprian understands about himself and the church um, is, is that share in Christ's sonship. Um, another really beautiful moment in the treatise is when he talks about um, the petition, give us this day our daily bread. Mm -hmm. He interprets that very strongly Eucharistically, right? Um, so it seems that at least some Christians were receiving communion every day already mm -hmm. in the third century wow. in North Africa. But he, he says something interesting that's challenging to me. He says, okay, so if you're going to pray for that every day, that means you're also praying that you wouldn't be separated from Christ's body by a serious sin, mm. right? Um, and, and then uh, at the very end, he recognized we do commit sins every day. So he's talking about uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Not quite the end. And there he talks about our need for forgiveness, but also our need to extend it to others. Mm. And, and this brings us to like one of the most profound things about St. Cyprian that I think we can all receive and that the church actually in recent times has invited us to contemplate. And it's this, um, as we forgive those who trespass against us, he points to Jesus's teaching uh, in Matthew 5 about how if you're going to offer your sacrifice mm -hmm. and you realize your brother has something against you to go and be reconciled first. Cyprian says the greatest sacrifice that we offer is our peace and harmony with one another. Why? Because as Christians, as the church, we are a people who are made one in the unity of the Father and the mm. Son and the Holy Spirit. That's a line that's actually quoted in the Second Vatican Council, wow. in the document on the church, inviting us to recognize that we're not just a club. Mm -hmm. We're not just people who agree with each other. We're not even just people who've committed to be nice to each other or committed to a certain way of life. We're people who are made one by the gracious share of the Trinity's own unity, wow. right? And, and that this should mark our very existence. The church is a gift. It's not something that we've accomplished. Yep. And, you know, I, I, that is such a great kind of call because it's something I, I wouldn't say that that is something I've like heard kind of that explicitly, that one of like the fundamental aspects of being a Christian and as it relates to communion, as it relates to confession is living in that unity with one mm -hmm. another, um, that we often talk about the importance of unity of doctrine of faith, which is mm -hmm. of course so important. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, um, unity of mind and heart and body that, uh, that is so, uh, dependent upon our offering that forgiveness to others, for sure, allowing ourselves to ask for forgiveness, uh, to God first and, but also to each other that that is just an, yeah, it's a powerful call and receiving our identity precisely from the church. Right? Yeah. Cyprian's also famous for saying that you can't have God for your father if you don't have yeah. the church for your mother. You should write that down. It's a right? great And quote. think about the way that, that we ought to honor uh, our mother. Yep, that is beautiful. Dr. Seward, thank you. Uh, this was a great kind of quick glance at Cyprian. We can never cover the saints to the no, extent that, that we would like. Uh, any, any, any final comments? No, that's it. Just uh, ask for Cyprian's prayers and uh, pray for, the, for faithfulness uh, to the church that he gave his life for and to his Lord. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next time on Catholic Saints.